Let's talk about tripods, what they're for and what to look for when buying one. Now for simplicity and clarity, I'm just talking about stills tripods. Video tripods and monopods fulfill different functions, so we're not going to go into that here. Now in my experience, tripods are the embodiment of the phrase, buy cheap, buy twice. Way back in the past, I wasted an awful lot of money buying cheap tripods, which then literally fell apart in my hands on more than one occasion. Eventually, I summoned up the courage and went and spent some proper money on something like this, uh, this is a Manfrotto 075 with an expensive head-on, which back in 1996 cost me just under £200, uh, with a student discount as I recall, and it's still going strong more than 20 years later after more than 20 years of professional service. So tripods are definitely one area where it is actually worth investing in the proper gear. So what do you need a tripod for? Well essentially, to keep the camera stable whilst you're shooting. And there can be many reasons you might need to do this. You could be shooting a time lapse where you're taking one picture every 10 seconds, 15 seconds, however long, over a long period of time. You might be taking a shot that requires you to use a very slow shutter speed. You could be creating a very precise setup where you have to get everything lined up perfectly and being handheld just isn't the answer. You might be shooting tethered to a laptop or desktop computer. Or you might be creating a photo montage made up of lots of shots or compositing an image together from several pieces. It might even be the case that a tripod allows you to come out from behind the camera and actually engage with and talk to your subject better. I think the biggest thing you need to consider when you're first looking to buy a tripod is how big and how heavy it is. Ultimately, the heavier a tripod is, the more stable it will be. And of course, we're trying to buy something that is stable and allows our camera to stay still. So a big heavy tripod is a good thing. Except that of course, the heavier a tripod is and the bigger it is, the less portable it is. And a lighter tripod, you're more likely to carry, but a really light tripod may not actually give you very much support because it might be so flimsy that the slightest tap and it's gonna start wobbling. A golden rule I've learned is that there's no use buying anything if it stays in the boot of the car or stays at home. If something is too big and heavy to carry, you're not going to carry it and you're not going to use it, so why own it? Therefore, there's kind of a sweet spot between something that is big enough to do the job in terms of tripods and something that's also light enough to carry. Uh, this great beastie here, this 075, I only tend to use nowadays in studio situations. Uh, gone are the days when I would carry it up a mountainside because I simply can't be bothered anymore. Uh, that's what I use carbon fiber tripods for because they're much more lightweight and more portable. But if I'm in a studio and I want as much stability as I can get, then yeah, a great big metal tripod like this is perfect. Another thing to look for is the minimum and maximum height the tripod can work at. It's really handy if you've got something that is stable when it's at eye level. So something that's only at eye level by the time all the legs are extended and a centre column is extended might not be ideal because it won't be that stable at full height and full extension. It's also useful if you've got a tripod that will let you shoot very, very low. Uh, and older ones, like this 075, don't tend to be quite as good for that. Um, it can be just as handy having someone you can have right down at floor level and still be stable. You'll have a choice of legs when it comes to your tripod, obviously, as to how many extensions there are. It doesn't really matter how many there are as long as it goes to whatever height you want or goes down to whatever height you want. The only thing to really look for is how you release and then lock those legs. There's basically two ways. You can have a quick release like these where you simply open and close a little lock like that. Or you can have a screw system whereby you unscrew and release and then tighten the screw again to lock it in place. Personally, I can't understand why anybody still uses screws. Um, it's an extremely long-winded way of doing things and it's a real faff every time you have to extend or lock a leg off to do all this screwing and unscrewing. As I understand it, the only reason screws ever exist is that they're mechanically very solid and reliable, but then these quick releases are pretty solid and if they do ever work loose, you can just tighten them off. Take some time to look at how versatile your tripod can be. 
this old school 075, for example, has a very solid, precise central column, which can be wound up so it can be adjusted very precisely. That's, that's quite handy. By comparison, this uh, much more up-to-date uh, 190, this little carbon fiber thing, it can be adjusted so that you can have the camera shooting at 90 degrees for flat copy work, for example. It can also have its legs splayed out really wide so that you can shoot right down at low levels. It's also got a little hook where you can hang ballast from, which kind of negates part of the fact that it's lightweight and therefore not that stable if you can hang extra weight off it. Something like one of these little Jobies, Jobbies, I'm never sure exactly how you're supposed to pronounce them. Incredibly versatile little tool, of course. You, know, you just wrap these legs around things to attach it to almost anything. But at the other end of the scale, you can't change the height of it. You know, the legs are as long as they are. You know, this will only ever be a tripod that's about 30 centimeters high. So whilst they're really useful things to shove in the kit bag for getting some shots, they're not going to take the place of a regular tripod. An absolutely crucial part of shopping for a tripod is getting the right head. What you might not realize is that all decent tripods will effectively come as two parts. They'll come as the legs, which is the obvious bit, and the head. Now, very often, of course, you do buy these two as a single unit. That's how they're sold by the manufacturers. But you can choose to chop and change things. You can have this set of legs with that head and so on. And the head really is somewhere where you shouldn't scrimp and save. I'm going to come on to the pros and cons of different heads in just a minute. But one general principle is that you will be extremely grateful if you get yourself any sort of quick release head. What this implies is that you've got a little plate. The plate attaches to your camera and stays there permanently. And then when you want to take your camera off the tripod or put it on the tripod, you simply drop the plate in and there you go. Without a quick release, every single time you want to put your camera on the tripod, you have to screw the camera in place. And of course, every time you want to take it off, unscrew it, it's an absolute pain in the backside. So get a quick release system of some sort. Now, I'm not going to get into the arguments about which is the best quick release system because life is too short. But what I will admit is that whilst all of my tripods are Manfrotto, the problem they've got is they use several different types of quick release plates depending on which tripod I'm using and I'm in the process of steadily and slowly changing to what's called an Arca system which is the same shape no matter which tripod head you use which has obvious advantages for somebody like me with several different tripods. Ball and socket heads are the quickest and easiest to use. All you do is just unlock, move, reposition and then lock in place. They're also generally smaller and lighter. The drawback is, of course, everything moves as soon as you release it, okay? Although you do get some heads that allow you to lock them in place and just pan with them. Three-way heads, like this one, tend to be much bigger and heavier and slower to use. But the great thing about them is they let you isolate movement in just one plane. So you can just pan, should you wish. You can just tilt, or you can just flip. Okay, so if you're precisely set up in one direction, you can choose to isolate movement in just one plane. Most precise of all are geared heads. Uh, I don't own a geared head, but they function very much like three-way heads, except that rather than unlocking, moving, and locking again, everything is on a gear system. So you simply wind them very, very gently, and they move in very, very precise increments. For something like architectural photography or any photography where you need to be very, very precise, geared heads are fantastic. They are also very, very expensive and tend to be very big and heavy and bulky. Speaking of weight and being big and heavy and bulky, make sure the whole tripod you're getting, both the head and the legs, are rated for the weight of the camera you're going to be using. Now, both of these you see here are obviously DSLRs. They weigh, depending on the lens, a couple of kilos. If you're only using a little mirrorless system, you can probably get away with less weight. But ultimately, you don't want something really, really heavy on top of a small, lightweight tripod that's not rated for that weight, because it won't be stable. And ultimately, we're all about stability. If your tripod wobbles a lot, it's not doing its job. A couple of extra features to look for when choosing a tripod. Spirit levels in various parts of the head. They can be either around the base of the head or on one of the various planes if it's a three-way head. They're very, very handy things to make sure that you are lined up perfectly and get your horizontals and your verticals right. Another useful little thing to have is some form of calibration marking. 
Uh, these are very useful if you're doing some sort of time lapse or some sort of photo montage where you're taking lots of pictures and you need to make a small incremental movement from shot to shot. This image, for example, is a photo montage of 60 images, 10 across, 6 down, and to keep things precise, all I did was move the tripod head by a small increment marked on the calibration scale around the column. That way I can be sure I'm shooting precisely the right amount each time, and it's very, very easy then for software afterwards to stitch it all together. Check your tripod's feet. Uh, spiked feet are great when you're in soft ground because the tripod will dig in nicely, but of course sharp spikes are not so handy on any other surface as they're liable to leave a scratch. So in a perfect world, you would have feet like this, which you can screw down to switch from being soft rubber feet to spiked ones. If your tripod has braced legs like this 075 does, a really good way to make sure you can set it up consistently every time is to measure exact distances down each brace and put a little tape mark at the same spot. That way, when you lock them in place, everything will be lined up nice and neatly. One last little comparison. That is the differences between carbon fibre and metal, usually aluminium. Carbon fibre is much, much lighter. Uh, these days, it's extremely commonplace, and because it's commonplace, it's actually quite a bit more affordable. Carbon fibre tripods used to be insanely expensive. The fact it's lighter is a massive, massive plus. That alone is kind of worth the money. One thing to look out for is that if carbon fibre gets damaged, it will of course just shatter. So the tripod will cease to be useful if the legs get damaged. Metal, if it gets damaged, will bend slightly. Now it might mean that you then can't extend one of the legs, but the tripod will still work as a tripod. I should point out though that whilst that might sound like a genuine concern, I have used both types for you know, in excess of 20 years and never had any damage to either of them and I take them to some very silly places. They've both been in the holds of aircraft over and over again, and even my carbon fibre tripods, which I've flown around the world with, have never actually been smashed, despite baggage handlers' best attempts to smash them. Ultimately, think about the use you're gonna put your tripod to. If you're gonna be in the studio, you're not likely to be moving very far, then I would get the biggest, heaviest tripod you can. Something like this, that's big and sturdy and very, very stable is ideal. If you're gonna be more mobile, if you're gonna be hiking up mountains and things, you are not gonna want one of these. I assure you, you're going to want the lightest thing you can get. So carbon fiber is almost certain to be your friend. Ultimately, think about the sort of shots you're gonna be taking with your tripod and get the one that suits those best. There's really no substitute for actually going out and physically handling a tripod up front. It's the sort of piece of kit that, just reading an online spec and thinking, oh, that weighs that much, it's that big, it's not the same as going out and physically handling one. So if you're able to get yourself down to an actual dealer and physically look at them, physically handle them, think, okay, that is actually really heavy, I'm never gonna carry that, or, oh, that's quite well built, because there's no substitute for doing that. You know, something that looks amazing online, a brilliant deal, really, really cheap, and then you get it in the post and you open it up and it's just plasticky and cheap and nasty, and you know that deep down, the very first time you take it out, bits are gonna start falling off it. Like I said right at the beginning, there's no substitute for actually spending money and getting decent kit when it comes to tripods. This one's lasted me more than 20 years. This one's now five or six years old. And in fact, I only replaced its daddy, if you like, because its daddy was just that little bit too big for my flight case. So sadly, I had to go and buy a whole new tripod rather than buy an entire new flight case. Otherwise, its daddy would have carried on working for years and years and years. They are essential bits of kit, but Consequently, since they're essential, they're worth spending money on. It's not the sort of area you should compromise because it'll be your photographs that suffer. There you go, lots of useful info to think about when choosing and using a tripod. If you're after more equipment information, there's an entire Equipment Basics playlist on my channel, so dig that out, like and subscribe as you see fit. And if you're after something that will really take your photography on by leaps and bounds, try my 90 Minutes to Better Photography course, the link to which is right here.